Let's move on to our speaker. Dr. Mandelberg, it looks like you're at Hamming World Headquarters in the gift shop today. Thank you for speaking to us about you and your research. Take the ball, Marty. Well, thank you so much. And in case someone joined and someone asked about the questions, no, that is not Hamming's red tartan bespoke jacket. First of all, it has the stupid black tuxedo lapels, which Hamming, if he had a jacket like that, no one's ever seen him in it. I put in the Hamming gift shop my favorite sweatshirt about mathematician. For those of you who can't read it, it says, I'm a mathematician. To save time, let's just assume that I'm never wrong. That wasn't Hamming, but it's a mathematician joke. And of course, the NPS Peacock Shock shirt. Okay, let me get back to where I am and am I sharing the screen? Reflections on the Richard Wesley Hamming lecture, you and your research. Since I'm not here for a grade, I went a little rogue. I think Hamming would have approved. Hamming's lecture, you and your research, I gave you some footnotes. I tried to write this the way Hamming told me to write way back when, or I've forgotten what he told me, and this is the way I write now in a book soon to be a major motion picture. You and your research, which was, as you know, given on 7 March at Belcor, and what does it do, I told you, and in his last course that Hamming taught in December 1977, I'm uh, sorry, 1997, he may well have given this lecture. As Professor Brutzman has put in the course description or on this lecture, this is Hamming's capstone lecture, and he first did it in 1986. After 40 years of, of experience, and I want to summarize a little bit of that, so this is my preface. You all saw the recording. Today is the 5th of June. Tomorrow, it'll be 25 years ago that he gave this speech. I don't know what that means, but it's a number. I appreciate the opportunity to share the reflections I have. Yes, I was Hamming's doctoral student for three and three quarter years. I round up to four, and I've spent three years researching and writing about Hamming for the biography and the legacy project that I put together. Several of the points that you've been studying in this course were experienced firsthand by me, and I'm trying to recapture some of those for you or for others. Hopefully my presentation will give you a little additional insight onto the today's version of the advice that Hamming is making for you. And I thank Professor Don Brussman for allowing me to participate in this class and to give this presentation and not to put a grade on my closed transcript. I have a copy of it, Don, so should you forge it, I've got it. A portion of today's presentation is in soon to be an award-winning book, Richard Wesley Hamming, Man, Mathematician and Mentor, which I copyrighted in 2018, made a few copies, got some reviews, and rewrote the last two chapters. There's the ISBN number. It will be on Amazon within the month. Okay, that's my picture when I look good, and that's the cover of a preview version of the book that I have available. Michelle, you've asked for one. I'll got one in the mail to you and as to anyone else who gives me a smell, snail mail. It's the first 50 pages of the book. Okay, I just put this in here for completeness. What's the course, Don? I think you might have written this or put it together. It's the capstone. But Hamming himself gave an abstract, which may or may not have been the version that you read he could have called it you and your engineering, you and your career, 
but why did he use the word research? It's the culmination of the previous chapters and Hamming felt that he was first of all a researcher, even though he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, his degrees are in mathematics, his abstract for your pleasure. Okay, what's today's presentation? A little quick one page overview of Hamming's career. I might catch something you don't know. And this is a standalone presentation. Why was Hamming invited to do this lecture? What were his goals? What are the major themes? What are the takeaways from 34 years ago? And my reflections for you for the next 20 years. Hamming in many of his lectures would say, I'm preparing you for the problems in 2020. Well, we, here we are in 2020. So I'm going to give you some things that will help you, hopefully help you for the next 20 years in your career. And some, a little Q&A. Short briefing, only 14 pages. The important thing on, on the left is the text, most of which you should know. I talked about it before. And a little bit more on Bell Labs. The pictures on the right and the top half were the scientists that Hamming worked with on the Manhattan Project. Hans Beda, Stanislav Ulam, Richard Feynman, Edward Teller, Enrico Fermi, Robert Oppenheimer, every one of these got a Nobel Prize and deserved it well. Some before the Manhattan Project, some afterwards. When Hamming left, while he was there, he called himself the computer janitor because he felt like a janitor compared to these world-class people. And he wanted, to, and that's when he started his reflections on what made them so great, what can I do for greatness? And it led ultimately to the lecture that you've read for today's class. The five people in the bottom were called the Young Turks at Bell Labs. Hamming, Shannon, Tukey, Macmillan, and Ling in an article I've written and in the book, you'll hear about what they were, how Hamming studied them, worked with them, collaborated with some of them. The reason the Hamming filter is called the Hamming filter or the Hamming window was because of John Tukey. He insisted on it because Hamming helped him. He and Shannon uncovered some more and I've got another paper I'm going to be writing about Hamming and Shannon. There's a couple of books on Shannon, but there is very little in the literature about Shannon and Hamming. I've uncovered some things from some unpublished papers, and I'll be coming out with an article if anyone's interested on Shannon and Hamming. So I don't have to read the chart. You can all do it. Why was Hamming given, why was Hamming invited to give this lecture? Well, he had retired 10 years earlier. He had worked with many scientists. Most of the people at Bell Labs couldn't match Hamming's scientific perspective from working with Oppenheimer, Teller, Feynman, Fermi, Beta, Ulam, Metropolis, all those people who were becoming great in the fields. So they wanted to understand what Hamming knew about what made them effective? How, why did they succeed? By 1986, Hamming was known to be a good writer and a very effective speak, speaker. Don, you made a comment earlier about becoming effective. I found in some notes that Richard Hamming well, when at Bell Labs was being asked to speak and he wasn't a good speaker. Those of you who might have clicked on the videos of Hamming talking about the computers of the future on that IBM video for PBS, Hamming, after the first one, took a Dale Carnegie course on effective public speaking because he knew he was going to have to speak. I commend to all of you, get comfortable speaking before a thousand people. Because if Don Brutzman gets his wish, some of you will be able to do such. 
Several things had changed since Hamming retired in 76. The Bell system was divested because it was a monopoly and people at the time decided a monopoly is, is a bad word. So the seven rel Bell regional uh, operating companies or Arbox were created. Bell Labs was broken in parts. Some went to a new corporation called Bellcar and then AT&T Bell Labs got part of it. Bellcor had new management who were not necessarily from the old Bell Lab days. They wanted to learn from one of the greats. So Alan Chenoweth, the VP of Applied Research, reached out and asked Hamming to present at the seminar, which only happened once. There was no follow-on seminar at Bellcor. I'll talk a little bit more about Bellcor later. Okay, what was Hamming's focused on? Hamming's lecture, there's an audio recording someplace. We, I have been unable to find a video recording. There are, are several versions of a transcript, some of them with typographical errors, some of them with slightly different perception because Hamming gave this speech in a number of occasions and so the literature is a little confused. His focus was why do so few scientists make significant contributions and so many are forgotten in the long run? He asked a lot of questions of scientists. He studied them and came up with some observations about the properties of scientists, some things that are controllable by them, their abilities, traits, working habits, attitudes, and philosophy. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to go to the yellow highlights here. This was the introduction to the speech. Some of you may have read it. Some of you have not. Basically, Alan Chenoweth had come from Bell Labs. He knew Richard Hamming. He called him Dick. He calls him an all-time great. And he went over the lunching with first the physics group, and asking hard questions and stimulating. He mentioned Hamming had written seven books, some of which were in the second edition, and in fact, some were translated into languages like Russian, and the Russians were very interested. That was the numerical methods book. I don't think the calculus or the probability book were translated into foreign languages. I love the last paragraph, Hamming is quoted as saying to Chenoweth, there are wavelengths that people cannot see, there are sounds that people cannot hear, and maybe computers have thoughts that people cannot think. And Chenoweth closed with an odd saying, well, with Dick Hamming around, we don't need a computer. Is he saying things that Hamming is going to say things that are going to surprise us? I think so. And Hamming talked, Hamming gave a preface. So I, I, I liked his preface. So I, it's talking about great research. He gives, for an example, relativity and Shannon's information theory. That's the level of research Hamming was talking about. He talked about being at Los Alamos and called himself a stooge. He was envious about Fermi, Teller, Oppenheimer, Beta, and all the others I've mentioned. He wanted to understand what it would take to be like that if he could. Remember, this is early in his career. Hamming was born 1915. He goes to Bell Labs in 1946. He's but 31 years old, about the age of the people on this Zoom conference, if you subtract down on myself. In his first few years, he's working with these young Turks. He's working with Shannon, who's younger. When he was at Los Alamos, he was working with Feynman, who was three years younger than him. He knew of the strength of age and energy and said, I've got to do something quickly. He had been thinking about error correcting for a while and he published in 47, actually prior to Shannon, some interesting articles internal to Bell. And then, of course, Bell Labs liked error correcting so much 
They said, we're going to patent it. Hamming had to wait almost two years for the Bell Systems Technical Journal. But he saw the necessity of doing that. He wanted to know why people were different. Why is it important? Why shouldn't you do significant things in your life? However you define significant. Otherwise, you're just rolling along. The government has spent a lot of money to send each of you to the Naval Postgraduate School and a lot of money to make this world-class facility. Hamming was challenging you to do something great. Okay, within the lecture, and as the slides, which I don't put up, that Don created, he talks about focusing on great research and talks an interesting thing. The average published paper is read by the author, the, the author, the referee, and per, perhaps one, I would say, a few people. If you go to the IEEE or the ACM, you can look at the statistics on the download. You can go to Calhoun, the Dudley Knox Library, and look at master's thesis you may have referenced and how many times they were downloaded. Not a lot. But really great papers, classic papers, are read by the thousands. The ones by Gauss, the ones by Kalman. In each of your fields, you found papers that you're using or you've used in your master's or doctoral things. Let me guess that the ones that were most powerful were downloaded a lot. So he's leading up to the point that if you want to be known, if you don't want to be just a footnote in history, you've got to write great papers. You'll see me come back to that in the close. The right problem at the right time in the right way means something of importance in a way that will give you new results that other people can leverage on top of, and in a way that you can be convincing. It's sorry to say there are an awful lot of, sidebar here, a lot of talk in the literature about the number of masters and doctoral thesis and dissertations that were never independently validated and years later come people come back and say it's wrong in the rush to publish and in journals the rush to have good articles they don't do the independent verification and validation they might do so it's important that if you do your work in the right way it will stand the success of time you can't plagiarize you have to properly cite and your work needs to be verifiable. Otherwise, if you're trying to come up with a new theory or a new answer, if it's not testable, if you can't measure it to talk to the previous speaker's talk, why is someone going to believe you? Personal traits. Hamming talked about using painting as an analogy. How does someone become a good painter? How does one become a good mathematician or an engineer? Most of you worked four to 14 years in your military service before you started at NPS, gave you some experience and a basis and built some personal traits. You need a style and you need to learn from your mentor your thesis advisor, your doctoral advisor. Hammock talks about vision. You need a vision to write a thesis, write a book, write an article. Gives the example of a drunken sailor in the bar. I'm not going to repeat it. You've all read it at least once. A vision is crucial if you want to succeed. Most of those, and I've had two doctoral I've advised two doctoral students and two master's students. And those that succeeded had a vision of the problem and a vision of the solution of how to get there. Hamming says, I can't run a race for you. You got to do it. I couldn't run the race for the one doctoral student who didn't graduate. Because 
because she couldn't get there despite my mentoring. Selling. It's critical that you sell your results by speaking, by teaching, by lecturing, by writing, by going to a conference and discussing it. If you can't describe clearly in two minutes your thesis, how is someone going to give you credit for what you've done? It's your responsibility. Hamming closes that no one told him the kind of things he had to learn in himself. Hamming thinks, or he's getting a little humorous, uh, Don will agree, Hamming had a strange Midwestern Chicago sense of humor, Nebraska Cornhusker. He would say something, and if you were lucky, there'd be a little smile on the corner of his face. He was baiting you a little bit to go ahead and be great. Okay, Hamming says, in order to be a successful professional, you've got to continue to learn your whole life. Technology changes. The market changes for your product or your services. The, the military is changing, even as we speak. Learn a style of learning, a style of thinking. Look at fundamental principles. You can look up facts. You're long beyond the point of memorizing formulas. You can go back and find the formula. But what's the principle? What's the philosophy? Don't drown in all the information. You don't have to read all the papers. There are good overviewing survey papers. Read those. Look at the ones that a lot of other people are reading. Avoid the ones that no one is. Look at the statistics. There's a lot more, you know, Hamming says 90% of all the scientists ever alive are alive now. You've got competition. In the military, you've got a lot of smart people. Those of you in, in industry, you have a lot of competition out there. Find your niche. Get your vision. Focus on the future. You're not solving yesterday's problem. You're, fo you're going to, I have to use the job of a professor like Don Bretzman and Richard Hamming is to prepare the student for the question not yet asked. You don't, hasn't been asked by someone. You could think up one, that's a research idea. But some senior officer or boss is going to give you a question in five years. And what Don and Hamming are trying to do is prepare you for those. Learn from the successes of others. Don't focus on the fail failures. Why did Feynman succeed in mathematics? Why did the contemporaries succeed? There's different styles of learning. You don't know until you try it. It's like a tool in your toolbox. You've got to try it and use it. You must do the learning. You must put in the time. How many of you have heard the expression, in order to really be a leader in your profession, in your field, you have to be prepared to put in 10,000 hours? Show of hands, anybody hear that before? Yeah, Michelle, not surprised, Don. Bert, Mike, John, 10,000 hours, you know, if you work 12 to 14 hours a day while a resident at NPS and say six days a week because you collapse one day or have to do your laundry and multiply that by the time those who worked at a doctoral probably did 10,000 hours. I know I did. It's taking me 10,000 hours to write Hamming's biography because he would be upset if I did it wrong. Have a vision to give you a direction, but that your findings are going to divert you. That's the important thing. The last point that I've heard Hamming say is, make your life count. Struggle for excellence, even if you don't know exactly where the excellence is going to lead you. Hamming's closing points at the tail end of the lecture. 
Know yourself, your weakness, your strengths. If you've got a fault, if you have difficulties doing something, or the problem has some issues, or your boss won't give you the computers, work around it. My word that I'll add to Hemmings is, do not accept the word no. Work with the person who gives you a no and turn it into a yes if. And once you've got a yes if, solve the if and now you've got a yes. It sounds simplistic, but that's what I've done. And those who I've studied who succeeded took a problem that other people couldn't do. Elon Musk, we're going to have a booster rocket. It's going to land on a ship bouncing around in the ocean. Oh, you can't do that. NASA couldn't do that. He did it. And he's got a reusable booster. And so his Dragon ship, lower cost per flight than anything NASA ever thought of. Don't take no for an answer. Keep on working. Work on important problems. Make sure it gets you deeply involved. Hamming would close with, go forth and become great scientists. Hamming challenged me. My own takeaway, the 10,000 hours, be passionate, limit your distractions. How many of you had time to go play golf a lot while you were working on your doctorate? Michelle, did you practice, did you, uh, uh, Michelle's distracted, hi there. Um, did you have, well, you were working on your doctorate, did you have time to go and improve your golf game? Or play tennis? No, I didn't or build have time a to person. do anything. <laughs> I, uh, I actually put everything well, aside to include even reading for pleasure because I felt like if I was reading for pleasure, I should be reading for my research. Right answer. I'll give you a side story. Back in 1978, when I started my dissertation work, I was still living at Herman Hall, in the officer's quarters, and I would eat in the mess, but I never, never, never went into the Trident room for fear that one beer would destroy those few brain cells that had the key secret to allow me to succeed when others were failing. I didn't drink in the Trident Room until three and a half years ago when I came back to start Hamming's biography. I drank elsewhere, but only after I had my doctorate in 82. Hamming didn't drink. Interesting. You must limit your distractions you must plan, this is my work, this is my words to you based on what I learned from Hamming and what I've carried forward. You must plan your work and work your plan. If you're going to write a book, start with an outline and stick to the outline. Blow out the outlines to chapters, to sections, to themes, to relationships. If you don't, it becomes an unfinished book. We all have unfinished books in us. The goal is to finish. You must talk with others about your work because you're going to hit cul-de-sacs and dead ends. And when they can understand what you're saying, then you know how to explain it to others. Hemming made me promise three things when he became my advisor that I would teach. And I immediately got an adjunct lecture position and worked for 22 semesters teaching a number of courses. It improved my ability to give lectures. Like you, I was 31 years old at the time, 31, 32, when I started working with Hamming. I had never taught before. He said, you must continue research. What's the use of going for a PhD if it ends with your dissertation? Same thing with a master's. When I got my master's, my boss says, time to publish. So in my middle 20s, after I got my master's in engineering from University of Connecticut, I started publishing short articles. I challenge you, 
a thousand word article, a two thousand word article. If you can't get into the the top articles in your field, get someplace else. Get practice in writing and communicating. Without it, you're a master's or a PhD student that hasn't used what you've been taught. So Hamming says you must publish, you must teach, you must continue your research. Okay. Comments and questions. Open open mics, please. Hamming is here. Marty is here. I'll channel them for you. Two reactions. Once once required. I'm pretty sure there's an old Navy uh, uh, regulation about this. But if people keep uh, bringing up uh, drunken sailors and whatnot, I think we have to explain that. And the the connection is actually right back to Toby's. So I think there's a there's a Navy uh, regulation about this. Might still be on the books. I don't know, but drunken sailor that people may not understand. The the drunken sailor scenario is covered earlier in the class. If if you have a one drunken sailor with no goal, then they after a period of time and they take n steps some number of steps, they will travel a distance proportional to the square root of n from where they started. But if there's a pretty girl in the on the horizon, then that same drunken sailor will proceed a number of steps proportional to n, not the square root of n, but n. Okay, so it's are you, are you making a tapering off progress or are you making linear progress at whatever befuddled rate your research might take you. Gee, Toby, you get what you measure. Huh? If 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 your sensor can't detect that pretty girl on the horizon, then your best laid plan is not getting anywhere. And if we apply the black box, we can tell if somebody's moving in a direction whether you can see the pretty girl on the horizon or not. Okay, so that's the backstory on the drunken sailor. There may be other drunken sailor stories that people could tell. Okay, okay, we'll hold off on this. Uh, we'll save that for the after course. Marty, thank you for summarizing the context and the essence of Hamming's advice, his challenge, and also how it related to you and, and and your career and your progress. So thank you very much for that. I get to see Richard Hamming give this talk a few times. He gave it to our class. He gave it to the school. You could see the lead in video to everybody in the superintendent's guest lecture. He He gave it one or two other times I was able to observe, including to the first ever IEEE conference on fuzzy logic, upon which afterwards he was given the Hamming Medal by Lotfi Zadat, the founder of Fuzzy, the, the inaugural Hamming Medal. It was really interesting, not just for all the things he said and those key points, which you've been exposed to in this course, which Dr. Mandelberg has just summarized for us, but I was always struck by how he left it. And he always made sure that every person in the room knew the focus was on them. He said, he always ended with, depending on the audience, some form of the three questions that he always posed. And the audience always thought they knew what was coming after they had heard all this stuff, but they didn't. His first question here was, who wants to do great research? Well, that's a easy. Any, anybody here want to raise your hands? Who here wants to do great work, whether it's research or your career or wherever you're going? How many, how many hands are going to go up on that? Okay, everybody's hands. That always happens. And, and of course, because the name of the talk is you and your research or you and your work or something like that. Everybody there is. And then he would ask, 
Well, the hands are still in the air. You know, his timing, uh, it took a few whiles to observe it to see what it, how many people are doing great work right now. And all those hands, you'd see them, some would stay up, some would go down. Not many would go down. A lot of them would start to wobble. And and then this was the the, the slam dunk. His timing was always impeccable. Everybody thought they knew what he was going to say next, something like work harder or do better. The third question, was: while the hands were still wobbling, was always, why not? Why not? And then he didn't usually wait for a pause or anything like that. He would just wave, sit down, walk off stage, whatever it was. Okay, why not? So I leave you with those three questions. Thank everybody for paying attention to Richard Hanning. We'll keep working on the course next week. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Marty. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend.